I'll be talking about a subject which we started in India in 1960s. Not only in India, I think in globally it was initiated in 1960s. Before 1960s, infertility was not a very important topic, either in the undergraduate course or in the postgraduate course. It was only after 1960. The reason I will tell you just now in a minute. I'll be talking more on the historical aspect of development of IVF all over the world, particularly in India. And the hurdles that we had to face, a few hurdles, not that all hurdles, I can say in 20 minutes of time, but a few hurdles there to face in the initial phase of IVF development, uh, particularly in our Indian context. And as you can see here, and in that particular uh, perspective, I think Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee had the initiative I didn't have the initiative of starting IVF in India. I was a just a clinician and Shubhash Mukherjee was the backbone or rather the person who initiated IVF in India and stimulated me to continue it after his death. Of course, his death was not expected, but suddenly he died. The way in which he died or the reason, purpose for his death, I'll tell in short, and the reason that I came to IVF is to leave behind all my surgical acumen. Uh, the reason to explain by the a few slides that will be followed, that will follow you in the lecture. Well, my journey in IVF started during 16 eventful years of my association. During my association with Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee, 1965 to 1981. We liked each other. I was an assistant professor at that time in the medical college, and Shubhash was also posted there as assistant uh, professor in physiology. I was in obstetrics and gynecology. And we liked each other because we had a common interest in uncommon subjects of ill-understood etiology. Few examples I will cite. And these are the few examples on the left-hand side, Shubhash, you can see all the endocrinological abnormalities, just like the one on the left-hand side. That is, she was so beautiful uh, at the time of her marriage. And uh, this is a, the large uh, photographs will show that this is the last end of our, of our life. Because she was married, she was divorced because her husband was a used for me and they were infertile. See the fate at that time of not only of India but all over the world. I mean that type of attitude was there that male cannot be infertile. It is the female who are responsible. And at that time, no investigation was performed. And on the right hand side, you can see that is the uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, uh, yeah, CAH. And that was the interest of Subhash Mukherjee, endocrinopathy, to find out the cause, to rehabilitate, rehabilitate them. On the right hand side, I had the surgical knack for hysteroplasty, tuboplasty, vaginoplasty, all those things. And uh, these are very rare cases, but uh, we did that thing. And because we had interest in this type of newer, newer developments in science or in technology, we liked each other and we tried to work together. And that's how IVF or, or infertility top, topic uh, gained some importance in Indian context. Now, evol evolution of IVF and our infertility management. Interest and concern about infertility management started, as I said, before 1960. India was known to be a country of population explosion. So who cares for infertility? But anyway, after 1960, somehow or other, infertility kept, uh, crept in. And it gained infertility, it gained some importance gradually and gradually. And we have come to a place today where infertility possibly is one of the topmost or gets the topmost priority in the, in the field of research, in the field of uh, innovations. Now, why and how? Because at that time in 19, around 1960, if you remember correctly, there is the human menopausal gonorotropin was isolated from human menopausal urine. And babies were born in two areas, one in USA, Kenzel, and uh, that is the, and the second one in Israel by Bruno Ludenfield. And two babies were reported, one in 1959, uh, that is in cases of hypogonadotropic, hypogonadism, and one in Israel and one in USA. And CC at that time, well, we uh, re regarded uh, Pincus as, uh, or give more priority, to, give me more priority to Pinkas rather than Bob Edwards, because Pinkas was very much involved in developing oral contraceptive, and uh, Bob Edwards was developing extra, extra corporeal fertilization. So CC initially, therefore, the Pinkas was re uh, developing these oral contraceptive tablets, and incidentally, clomiphene citrate 
which was intended to be an anti-fertility drug, proved to be a fertility product. That was in 1965. That was in 1960. So gradually the trend was coming on up in developing hormonal preparation, and it started from anti-fertility drug to pro-fertility drug, and that is how the interest was creeping gradually and gradually. Now, extensive basic and clinical research on follicular genesis, preparation of media, in vitro growth of human oocytes, and clinical use of pelvic scope for diagnosis of pelvic pathology. These were, I mean, that is in Germany, and uh, you, you know, uh, I mean, these are the areas where interest people started having interest, and gradually the subject of infer infertility was gradually and gradually developing. In addition, during the post Second World War period, Unexpected, unexpected global population explosion, especially in the developing world, uh, leading to unplanned. If you, you remember, you might not be born at that time, but uh, you would ask your father or grandfather that world leading to unplanned mass vasectomy. Sanjay Gandhi was a pioneer from that point of view. Tubectomy plus MTP. That was unplanned in 1971. That is the MTP law came in India, and uh, people were allowed to do MTP. Invariably, uh, because even the bachelors went for vasectomy and even unmarried for, uh, for the lure of money. Some money was given, some incentive was given. So, so many poor people had were vasectomized and had, had unplanned tubectomy that when they got married, they wanted a baby. And that is the reason why uh, the tubectomy became very popular. At that time, from 1965, you still remember. Uh, till 1975, so many papers came in, or so many modif modifications of tubectomy. One in Vancouver, one from uh, uh, Hammersmith, one from uh, India, uh, the Professor Shirodkar, and one from uh, England. These are the poor people who pioneered the different modifications of tubectomy, and from there we crept into I IVF. Because at that time, IVF was also slowly, slowly, gradually uh, developing by many people in the world, Carl Wood from Australia, and Bob Edwards from England and so on, and uh, Howard Jones from America. So, they, so gradually it was found that IBA was superior to these uh, very difficult techniques of your uh, reversal of tubectomy or reversal of vasectomy. Increase in global population, at that time there was a very much increase in global population. It was not because of birth rate, but it was because of longer Lifespan of the, so many development discovered during the world uh, during the world war that uh, birth rate increased in India. I still remember Minu Masani's book. We used to read it, matriculation. Our India in book our India. The average birth rate of an Indian pop man was 27 years. It gradually came in, came in, came up, and now you can look at me that I'm, I'm 92 and still surviving. So the birth rate the and longer, I mean, survival rate was more uh, rather than the birth rate, and birth rate was marginally increased. Moreover, in developed areas of the world, changing lifestyle, diet habit, rapidly multiplying the incidence of PCO or endometriosis, requiring special attention for infertility management. Demand for infertility management was increasing, but available knowledge and resources were very scanty and limited. Extensive research and clinical trial continued in two areas of infertility during the period between 1965 and 1975. I clearly vividly remember this period and how, how much we worked for this uh, wage resection, how much we worked for uh, reversal of operation, how much we worked for monitoring of population. Simple monitoring of population was so difficult. I'll show you two uh, uh, initial techniques of how to monitor by insular cervical score by BBT. We used to do it very meticulously, very thoroughly, so as to find out the exact time of uh, your triggering, the HCG triggering, by LH kit, by your change of urine color, by the change in the basal body temperature pattern. Now, these were two areas, where these two areas were ovulation induction, based on the concept of two gonadotropic visual theory, heart surgery for correction of muscle and tubal correction. Knowledge about physiology of follicular genesis and ovulation, the concept of two gonadotropin two cell theory was introduced in 1941, but practical application was implemented in 1960. Two gonadotropins, all of you know, FSH and LH, 
the two cells were granulosus cells and thicker cells producing estrogen one cell and thicker cell. And these were the basic hormones and basic cells for your ovulation and your folliculogenesis. Wage resection was very popular uh, in 1965. I still remember uh, Stein and Leventhal published uh, two papers where 10 pregnancies were achieved uh, out of, I think, 25 uh, operations they did as wage resection in uh, PCO patients. Now, monitoring of ovulation uh, and the timing of ovulation. Uh, of your HCT in the ovulation triggering, that's the HCT injection, especially for IUI. IVF was not very popular at that time, but the IUI also developed simultaneously, not very much ahead of IVF, 75, 76, 77. And at that time, the timing of giving HCT was very important so that they could do the, uh, I mean, say, insemination perfectly at time. Two very important parameters were followed. In pre IVA, at that time, ultrasound was not there, not to talk about RIA and EIA, insular, insular cervical mucus coding. And we had a typical Shubhash Kukati was a pioneer in developing the cervical mucus code. Cervical mucus around and face, it, it, the cervical mucus was the biological mirror of the endocrine profile in the periovulatory period. I mean, when the, you know, the physiology, estradiol goes up, goes up, and attends a peak or down about day 10 or day 11. Then a plateau for 48 hours, and during this plateau, anytime LH surge may occur and may cause a rupture of the follicle and ovulation occur. You have to catch that particular point and give HCG at that time. If you give earlier, it will be a few progenic, it will be better where ovulation has already occurred. So, that is the rising E2 level in the late follicular phase, peak and plateau of E2 level that you can catch by cervical mucus and by not by basal body, but cervical mucus, timing of HCG trigger on ovulation has already occurred if you can see by the cervical mucus or on the finding pattern of the cervical mucus uh, under the microscope. I'll show you that this is the pattern. This is a gaping external os. The cervical mucus becoming very thin, very transparent. And you can see the stretchability of the cervical mucus, 10 centimeters, skin per feet as you call it. And this is a, a, a picture of the second degree parting of the cervical mucus. If we spray it on the, on the dry slide, and this is the first order firing. That means that each follicle will produce 100 to 125 picograms of estradiol. This is the picture that you get in cervical mucus, first degree branching, second degree branching. HCM, sorry, LH, LH peak is about to occur. And this is the exact time of giving the HCG, I mean, HCG trigger for ovulation to occur exactly 36 to 48 two hours after the HCG injection. And this is the progesterone score. And the progesterone score one means that. Uh, Ovulation has already occurred, dark, meshy background with plenty of leukocyte and plenty of the inflammatory cells. So that is how we used to catch the exact time of LH surge and giving the, or just time immediately before the LH surge. And if you give uh, your trigger uh, before, too, too much before, then it will not be effective. But if you give it after the LH surge has already occurred, you will have the ovulation already occurred and this is the type of cervical mucus that you see under the microscope and this is the firing pattern instantly. So these were the cases. Another parameter of ovulation is the basal body temperature. We again said that the two hormones are there which are thermogenic in the human body, particularly in the woman's body. In the woman's body, progesterone was thermogenic and, and androgen is a thermogenic. So all this is temperature, you can ask the lady to just uh, uh, monitor the temperature every day early in the morning before rising, before getting out of bed, then that will indicate whether she is hyperestrogenic or she is hyperprogesteronic or he is hyperprolactinemic. Some some idea you can get and how we used to have this is a biphysic temperature, I mean three types of biphysic temperature, but this is ovulatory temperature. But anovulatory, this is the elevated, elevated uh, basal, elevated monophysic. Elevated monophysic means she doesn't have progesterone, but she has got the androgen. Androgen, well, it is the PC. So this is a typical temperature of polycystic ovary. This is low monophysic, below 96 point, below 97.4. So this is your either low, uh, I mean, premature ovarian failure. She doesn't have a progesterone, or this could be a hyperproductive. So this will reflect the hormonal profile, I mean roughly, crudely, this will reflect the hormonal profile and the way in which you have to treat the patient. So that's why our monitoring parameter, we did not have RIA, we did not have ultrasound scan. 
That was the only way by which you could monitor and when to give HCG, that was also. This is a luteal phase defect, short luteal phase defect, and this is also discordant luteal phase, not uh, elevated, constantly elevated in the luteal phase, and these are only short, less than nine days, less than seven days. So that is definitely a defective luteal phase type of temperature. So now the attention is gradually coming towards IVF. In fact, it was suddenly a hot topic, and research started on both technology and uh, on hormones related to childbirth. People started trying to fertilize the egg outside the body. The first H2 baby Louisa Brown, you know, in 1978 and July. And research on IVF in Calcutta. Now, I'm talking of the whole India. At that time, India and Bombay, I mean, uh, uh, there's Indira Hinduja, Nehru Hamsutia, and uh, my friend Anand Kumar, Professor Anand Kumar, we started uh, trying. But they started, uh, we started, Mehru uh, Antotia myself started in public sector and they started through ICFR. And myself, Shubhash, uh, and about uh, our Calcutta team, myself and Shubhash started working on infertility life, uh, infertility since uh, uh, that time, which is the 1970s. While Shubhash was concentrating on basic aspect of reproductive endocrinology, like oocyte maturation, then uh, uh, site growth and in vitro and extracorporeal fertilization. I was working more on clinical aspect, which is, as I said, tuboplasty and vaginoplasty, basic section, histoplasty, etc. Finally, we developed a common interest of starting IVF in India, a technology which at that time was very much in understood subject globally, whether the test tube grows in the test tube or test tube grows in the, on the petri dish. We did not know about that also. So research in IVF in Calcutta, the research that the Calcutta duo, myself and Shubhash was developed, had been dealt a blow where we were transferred, we were in government service. So we were transferred, myself to Shiliguri, that is the North Bengal, and Mukherjee to Bakura. Still, we used to come to Calcutta on a weekend, uh, every week. Uh, in the midst of this, suddenly Shubhash announced the birth of Durga, that is uh, India's first and the world's second test to baby on October 3, 1978. But few people believed, that was a tragedy, few people believed that the research uh, could have been possible in a power cut prone, uh, power cut prone district without basic facility. So they did not believe it. And death of Shubhash, Shubhash could not accept the criticism. He committed suicide in 1981. His death well stimulated me because he was, uh, he was stamped as a liar and that I could not tolerate. His death made me more adamant to take the research forward. And that's how I continued in Calcutta. Initial hurdles. I also faced my share of doubters. As a surgeon, by that time, I had been successful in the contact in cervix and vagina in a series of women born with cervical vaginal latricia. Finally, three of these women, when married, successfully delivered viable babies. So that made some name for me. And uh, when I uh, lectured about it in Delhi, Vellore, and Bombay, People politely clapped, but their lack of credence in research happening in Kolkata was apparent. The same fate awaited my papers abroad. The papers initially was excitement, which fizzled away, but learning that the researcher was from India. So they could not believe in India, and that I could not tolerate. Now, they initially, they did not believe Calcutta, and finally, and also secondarily, they did not believe India. My first test to baby, second in India, with a team of youngsters, with a team of youngsters, if I take uh, Hinduja, Indira Hinduja is a documented uh, first test to baby in, in, in India, uh, with a team of youngsters that included Shubhash, uh, Sudarshan, Bhuldo, Siddhar, Siddhartha, Chatterjee, Bani Kumar Mitra, Arup Maji, Partho, he passed away very recently, Dr. Swamomitra Ghosh and Ratna Chattopadhyay, and my young but senior, he, he was a, he was supposed to be an embryologist, but actually he was a pathologist. But uh, we took him because he used to use test tubes and he used to use the petri dishes in the media. He had some idea. We didn't have any idea about the media test tube and uh, your petri dishes. So I took him, Shubhi Dattu, and he's also very in now. I started, uh, we started a research in small garage. In my in, in a garage, I, we started the research of IVF and MSCIK. Finally, Imran, the first test to baby in Calcutta, was born on 3rd November 1986. Uh, financial and legal constraint. 
this was a time of, at that time, it was, I think uh, uh, Mr. Indira Gandhi was the prime minister, and that was the area or the period where they allowed for foreign travel. Uh, five pounds was allowed for foreign travel, and no more foreign currency. Importing machine and uh, disposables were next to impossible. Little things like single use debut <coughs> transfer catheter, uh, made of plastic, would have an import duty 300 pounds slapped on it. So you can see, imagine how difficult it was to start IVF in a country like India. So it was not until 1989, the second test tube baby was born in my hand. But when Mr. Manmohan Singh, the then, he was the finance minister at that time, not the prime minister. Manmohan Singh, the then finance minister, liberalized the economy. I could deliver four test tube babies in a month. I finally, uh, I'm sorry, finally people stopped doubting my work when these babies were delivered and they believed in my work and also work of Calcutta team, which started in 1975, I think we started in 1975 or 70s and they began. After my retirement, I put my retirement benefit uh, for acquiring a plot of land in Salt Lake for research and a deputy secretary also, these are not very important. And we, the building was built over four years and was inaugurated in 1989. The flow of patients certainly increased, and it accommodated to and to accommodate uh, clinical, academic, and research activities. We require some more extra space. And Mr. Jyoti Bhushmashu, he's the chief minister, helped me in that, and we've been to second house now. Now we were recognized. Uh, we are now recognized for PhD course. So we started from a zero, and now we are now recognized for so many academic activities. PhD course in reproductive medicine of Calcutta University, West Bengal University. In addition, we are also involved in collaborating research work, all those things. But the thing that I want to say that uh, we started from zero. Now we have reached, and I'm very happy to see that uh, India, with the effort of so many youngsters to follow, that they have been able to place India in a recognized position in the IVF map of the world. And I'm very sorry. My current approach of infertility management is to identify markers which could predict success in the in the world and also to find out measures which may prevent failure. So I had an inspiring ambition and a challenging journey, a topic on which I delivered a lecture at Infocom meeting at Kolkata, cycle number long back 16, 2016, organized by House of uh, ABP, that is Anand Bajar Kutti. And thank you very much for your patient hearing. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, I've given my uh, story in my perspective about development of IVF, not only in Calcutta, but in India. We had at that, that time four centers. One is in Calcutta, the other one is Bombay, third one is Jaipur. And there is more Mohanlal Jaisankar. Uh, yeah, Jai I, I, I don't remember exactly the name. And the fourth one, at uh, uh, Bangalore. Bangalore is a Gunoshila, not uh, Kaminira, but before that Gunoshila was very prominent in this particular team. So Calcutta and uh, Bombay, there were two teams. At that time, one is uh, uh, Dr. Anand Kumar and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, and uh, second one was uh, your, uh, uh, yeah. yes, uh, so second one, I take you Yes. Anyway, and the third one is was in uh, uh, Bangalore. Bangalore was your. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you very much for your patient hearing.